they would sit his wife down and tell her, we know where he is. Paul's in the garage. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Paul Jandro. Viewer discretion is advised. Paul Stephen Jandreau was born on December 5th, 1959, and he was born and raised in Enfield, Connecticut. However, by the time this case happens, he is now living in Moyoc, North Carolina. He had actually built his own home there in an area called Brumsey Landing. Paul had been married a few times before, and with those marriages, he did have two children that he loved very, very much. And then Paul served for 31 years in the United States Navy. He actually worked himself up to the rank of Grandmaster Chief. But by the time this case happens, he is retired from that. And he is working at a shipyard called BAE Systems. And I, I believe that this is like a some kind of, it's a shipyard where they work on specifically on Navy ships. Paul had been described as just a really solid dude. He was a stand-up guy very professional, very kind. He was extremely close with his family. Um, and like I said, he was an, an excellent father. When neighbors of his would be interviewed later, they would say that Paul was just this, he was just a good guy. He was someone that never would hurt a fly. He wanted the best for everyone. He helped anyone that he could that was in need. His neighbors, his coworkers, his family, they all said, all of them said, that they absolutely loved this guy. But unfortunately, someone would take all of that away. So back in the summer of 2002, Paul was working out at a gym, the gym he went to all the time, when he interacted with a woman named Letitia. In 2002, Letitia is 29 years old and she is a bodybuilder who competed in bodybuilding events, but also she was working in human resources at a children's hospital. The differences between Paul and Letitia were huge. Uh, Paul was a very outgoing guy. He was uh, outspoken. He was talkative. He wanted to interact with people, very extroverted, whereas Letitia was described as very shy. She kind of held a lot back. She did not really like going out and doing things. She was more of an introvert. But Paul saw something in her at the gym, and they began to interact, and one thing led to another. They began to date, and then eventually they became married. They were they got married, or he proposed to her while he was still technically married to his previous wife, but at that point they were already going through the divorce process. They were no longer together, and so that's kind of when that began to happen. Letitia first obviously moved in with Paul, and then they got married. And when you would ask people from the outside looking in, it appeared that Paul and Letitia had a really good relationship that they were perfect for one another, despite being so different, but being so opposite. But you, you know what they say, opposites attract. And any time they were out in public together, it, it always appeared that they were very affectionate towards one another. By 2009, uh, she is no longer, Letitia is no longer working at the Children's Hospital. She got a job for Blackwater Airlines while still competing in bodybuilding competitions. Paul would uh, follow her, you know, to all these competitions, even the out-of-state ones. He would always go with her because he was happy for her. He was proud of her and he wanted to support her in this endeavor. And he would always come home and brag to all of his friends and family about, ah, she won again, you know, she, she, he was always very excited for her. But by June of 2010, something happened. It was specifically June 30th, 2010. Paul did not show up for work at BAE Systems, and that was extremely unusual. Paul never missed work. He was extremely loyal to his job, and even if he ever had to not show up, he definitely called. But no such call ever happened. At that time, Paul was actually working on an extremely important project that he was supposed to be presenting very soon. And he was adamant about getting this project done. And so they thought right away that this is something weird that he just didn't show up to work. And because of his, who he was, like his character and you know this, 
never missing work kind of thing. Once his family found out, he was reported missing literally that day. So at that point, the sheriff's department gets involved and they actually drive out to Paul's house. And when they get there, they do notice that there are several vehicles in the driveway. But when they knock on the door, nobody answers. And there were a couple of uh, people who knew Letitia's phone number. And so they would call her and say, hey, have you seen Paul? He's been reported missing by his family. And she goes, oh, I had no idea because she apparently was she was at work. And so she said, OK, I'll leave work now and I'll head over. Letitia arrived at the Jandro house and she let police inside willingly. She told police that her and Paul were sleeping in separate bedrooms. The excuse she gave was that it was because he had a CPAP machine that was super loud and, it, you know, it interrupted Letitia's sleep. And so he was sleeping in a different room when she showed police. Paul's bedroom that he was sleeping in, the CPAP machine was gone. She goes, well, that's kind of weird. And when police began to kind of push her and question her about their relationship, she provided information that most people never knew about Paul and Letitia, and that the two of them had a very open relationship and that they were both technically allowed to see other people. And so she tells police, oh, maybe he just brought a CPAP machine to whatever woman he's sleeping with right now. But she, at that time, wasn't coming off as, like, guilty of anything. I mean, it's, the stories she's saying, you know, could be true. And technically, this, these types of things happen all the time. You know, couples have open relationships and they sleep at their new partner's houses. Like, it's not uncommon. It certainly didn't say that Letitia is guilty of doing something to him. She did not give them the authority to thoroughly search their house, and they would need a warrant to do so. On July 1st, they are beginning to look at his cell phone data, and they find that he his cell phone had pinged in the area of Elizabeth City, and that was about 30, 35 minutes away from where he lived. That area does have a lot of hotels, and so that's when Letitia was like, well, see, he probably just went to a hotel to be with whatever woman he's with right now. And they even got a tip from a hotel that said, yeah, we saw, we think we saw Paul once he saw, they saw a photo of him. Uh, he had checked into this, to this hotel and that Paul was acting very strange. But then when police said, hey, can we check your CCTV cameras? Because they had them. They said, yeah, of course. And the person they were talking about that they thought was Paul was not Paul. So it was, it was mistaken identity. The same day they go to the hotel to get the CCTV footage that turned out not to be Paul, they were contacted by a construction worker who found a cell phone in Elizabeth City. And when the cell when the person found the cell phone, he opened it up and it was he was able to call someone on it, which was like Paul's brother, to say, hey, we have this phone, we don't know who it belongs to. And that's kind of how they piece it together that this was Paul's cell phone. And so it was turned over to police. Then in early July, police get a 911 call with regards to some very odd uh, things going on at Paul Jandro's house. Letitia and another man who was later identified as Letitia's brother, they were seen moving furniture out of the house and there were these packing boxes all on the front porch. When police got there, they said, hey, you need to stop what you're doing because we have an open investigation now and we can't have you tampering with potential evidence. So they told her, put everything back in the house, and she did. They would also tell police, the neighbors, that they were, that they saw Letitia and her brother, like, she had that, you know, that can of uh, fake snow you can spray during Christmas, like on your Christmas tree or whatever. Uh, she was seen spraying that on the windows and then putting wrapping paper up on the windows to cover up so no one can see inside. Very odd behavior, extremely suspicious to go along with them moving stuff out of the house. And when they interview neighbors, they actually interview a neighbor who knows the, knew the Jandros a little bit more than say other people did. So I guess about two weeks prior to Paul disappearing, Paul made a police report that somebody keyed his car, which they would later determine was likely done by Letitia because it was actually keyed in the garage. And this neighbor said that the relationship between Paul and Letitia was not as strong as they gave off to the to normal people like family and friends, that actually they were going through a really rough time. Letitia and Paul tried to get pregnant and Letitia actually became pregnant with twins and they did so through IVF. But about 21 weeks into the pregnancy, 
unfortunately, the, she lost the babies, and this was devastating to her and to Paul. And Letitia had told the neighbors and some friends that her and Paul were beginning to separate. And as a matter of fact, they found out that Paul had filed for divorce from Letitia, which now makes more sense with Paul and Letitia sleeping in different bedrooms. Not this whole, we're sleeping with other people and he's possibly with another woman right now. Then police um, asked Letitia, hey, we need, we need Paul's computer, his laptop. Well, are you willing to give it to us? And she said, yeah, I'll give it to you guys. So when they show up to the house, there is a note on the door. The note says, went to River's Edge, call me on my cell, thanks. So police call the cell phone, Letitia doesn't answer. They also find out that that same day, Letitia called 911 to report that there were people outside of her house. And so she left her house because these were like strange people. And so she left and she said she went to Chesapeake, Virginia. Well, police then go back to the Jandro house and they find out that Letitia was not in Chesapeake, Virginia. She was hiding inside the house. She didn't answer the door when they knocked earlier because she was hiding in a closet. And for whatever reason, she just would not open the door for police. It's extremely erratic and just very strange behavior from her. So then they finally get a warrant, an actual warrant to search the Jandro house thoroughly. And they go to the house again to present that warrant Letitia once again doesn't answer the door. They find out that the garage door is actually unlocked and open, so they enter it that way. And But there was this barricade of like boxes and garbage that was clearly put there to prevent someone from getting in the garage. But police got around it. And as they go through the house, they that's when they find Letitia hiding in the closet. She told them that I was hiding in the closet. I didn't answer the door the multiple times you came here. I didn't answer my cell phone because I was afraid that people were gonna think I did something to Paul. She wouldn't look at police, she wouldn't make eye contact, she kept her hands like in her face like this, she was like curled up in the, you know, the fetal position, like trying to hide herself because they had body cams and everything and this was all being recorded. As the one police officer is questioning her, they are conducting the search and that's when they go into the garage and they find this big blue tote. There was this plastic shower curtain that had been like taped around the top of the tote. Once they took all that off and they took the lid off, they, they it was just this horrific smell of decomposition, something that they had smelled before. And they look inside and it's clearly, it's Paul. They found him. So they go back to her, to Letitia in the house while she's still trying to cower and hide her face. And they look at her and they basically tell her, we know where Paul is. And she goes, you know, like, no, you don't. You don't know where he is. And they say, Letitia, Paul's in the garage. We found Paul. Whoever put him in there had put layer upon layer of like plastic and sheets and stuff to kind of like really hide his body in that tote. There was also cat litter pour, poured over him. I'm guessing to mask the odor but it, that did not work. Then they continue searching the house and they go to the master bedroom. They find traces of blood spatter on the wall. Part of the rug in the master bedroom had clearly been cut out and there was wood glue found next to this cut out carpet that looks like someone was trying to re-glue the carpet back down. Underneath the carpet, they found this divot in the, the wood flooring and it was clearly from a bullet. They also found a bullet hole in a wall and they found an actual bullet. Now to police, it's very clear. Paul was shot and killed in the master bedroom of the house, and then someone put his body into a tote to hide him. At that point, Letitia is confronted uh, and said, listen, you need to tell us what happened because this isn't looking good for you. And she tells them this story about like, oh, I hired some men to beat up Paul because Paul was hitting her, he was abusing her. And they find out that that's not true whatsoever. They actually look further into Letitia and discover that she had a history of, of dating men, but manipulating those men. That she got these men to do things for her on behalf of her. And that she lied about what these men had done to her. So it was just this obvious, consistent behavior that she had, not only with Paul, but with previous men. So she's arrested and she's booked. And at the jail, she says, all right, I'll talk. And that's when the police bring her to an interrogation room. And she says, 
I shot and killed him in self-defense. She said that Paul attacked her and then he came into the room with a gun. This all happened because of a fight, she says. And he pointed a gun at her and he said, I want you out of the house now. And then Letitia says, uh, she was, she said, okay. And then she begins to leave, but then she grabs a gun, a 45 millimeter, and she walks back into Paul's bedroom and she said, I just kept shooting at him. They found the gun, Letitia's gun, in her car, but the gun wasn't hers. The gun had been registered to one of her previous boyfriends. She stole the gun from one of her previous boyfriends. They also found in the house a receipt uh, for a purchase of a large blue tote, because the tote that he was found in was very new looking. They take that receipt, they go to the store where it was purchased, they're able to pull up CCTV, and lo and behold, they see Letitia herself purchasing that blue tote, that Paul's body was found in. By September of 2012, she is now officially charged with Paul's murder and she goes to trial. At trial, she continues to say, I was self-defense, which didn't make sense even with her own story because she said that she was able to leave the bedroom without any, like, without being resisted and that she retrieved a gun of her own and came back to Paul to shoot him because she said he threatened her with the gun. But again, she had left. She left and then came back. Paul died of not just one gunshot. He actually had multiple gunshots, which is evident not only in his body, but also there was that, clearly there was a bullet in the, in the wood. So he must've been laying down at one point when he was shot. And then the bullet that through the wall was probably when he was still standing up. And he was also shot in the head. And the jury didn't buy her story. Um, they believed that she uh, murdered him uh, just murdered him and it wasn't self-defense. So she would be convicted, uh, found guilty and convicted, and she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. She appealed in 2014, but was denied. Um, and the motive behind it was that she didn't like the fact that Paul was divorcing her um, because Paul made good money. He had this big, beautiful house. She had, you know, with him, she had everything she wanted and she gravitated towards wealthy men, uh, manipulated wealthy men and, at, you know, she wasn't used to being the one to be kicked out and getting divorced and losing all of that. And so she killed him to maintain, you know, his property. But also the fact that she, you know, was pregnant with twins, they lost the baby, and that caused a lot of turmoil in the relationship. It Their marriage began to just take a downfall after that. And it just, you know, it was just clear that this was a premeditated thing. I mean, first and foremost, she bought a tote to hide his body. So she knew she was going to be covering up this murder. It was, she, this wasn't, you know, this wasn't self-defense. This wasn't anything like that. But thankfully it didn't take long. So thankfully Paul Jandro got the justice he rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, Rooney Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. Please subscribe. Follow me over on TikTok. Link below. My battery's about to die. And yeah. Uh, follow me on TikTok, subscribe here, and all that stuff. I tell true crime stories, obviously, here and on TikTok. Recommend a case to my email address. My email is listed below in the description where the link tree is. And recommend me a case about the name of the person, where it happened, and when it happened. I'll add it to my list and pick my cases at random. So, all right, I gotta go. It's because the battery's gonna die. So, we will see you for the next case. True crime, Maroonies. Blah, 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 blah.